Can you say, this is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky? Why do we have to? Just try it. Well, I can't. Deep breath. <laughs> okay. This is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky. Lindsay Malloy. Ah! No, wait, say Dr. Lindsay Malloy. Dr. Lindsay Malloy. No, come back. <laughs> this is Dr. Lindsay Malloy. Welcome to the Potomac Parenting Podcast. One more time. And then after that, can we have a candy No. <laughs> Please, Mommy. Okay, ready? Pandemic Parenting Podcast. Welcome to the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. I'm Dr. Amanda Zelahusky. And I'm Dr. Lindsay Malloy. We are two psychologists, scholars, and moms, and together we co-founded Pandemic Parenting. We're here to share science-based research and help all who care for kids navigate this challenging time together. Please note that the information contained in this podcast and on the Pandemic Parenting website are intended for educational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this podcast or provided on the website are intended to be a substitute for professional psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. No doctor-patient relationship is formed between the hosts or guests of this podcast and listeners. If you need the qualified advice of a mental health or medical provider, we encourage you to seek one in your area. So tell me about getting shots. It hurts. On a scale of one to 10, if one means that there's no pain at all and 10 means it's the most pain in the whole world, well, how much pain does it, is it getting a shot? 10. You think it's 10, the most pain in the world? Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell me a, um, about getting shots. Well, I got one before, but I didn't like it. What does it feel like getting a shot? They really hurt you. So that was me interviewing my six-year-old son and my four-year-old daughter about vaccines. And as you could hear, they are mostly focused on the pain aspect, just how much the shots hurt, something that they talk about uh, often. So whether it's the host of vaccinations our children get in their early years or our annual flu shots or now the COVID-19 vaccine for those who are old enough, So many of us, children and adults, don't like the idea of getting poked with a needle or seeing our children in pain, even when we very much know the benefits. I was really excited to sit down with child pain management expert and clinical psychologist, Dr. Christine Chambers, to ask her questions that my children and I have about shots and about needles. Dr. Chambers is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Pain and Child Health at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. She's also the Scientific Director of a National Knowledge Mobilization Network, Solutions for Kids in Pain. You can find more info about her work at kidsinpain.ca and it doesn't have to hurt.ca. And we'll be sharing and talking about some of those resources throughout this episode. In this episode, you'll hear how to prepare children for vaccinations and needles, strategies for reducing pain from shots, how our emotions as parents can impact our children while they receive medical care, and so much more. I really appreciated how many practical tips she shared, ones that I've even tried with my own kids already. As always, let us know your thoughts or questions by tweeting us at Pandemic Parent or by sending a message through our website, pandemic-parent.org. So the first thing I actually have is a little bit of a story about my uh, then five-year-old, probably about a year ago when we were talking, of, he was asking me, I lay in bed next to him at night, right? So we have all these fun little conversations. And he was asking me how we were going to finish or be done with the virus. And I said, well, there's a lot of, you know, really excellent scientists who are working on a vaccine. And we started talking a lot about vaccines and that was what was going to eventually end the virus. And at night, sometimes he would ask me to show him pictures of the scientists who were working on the vaccine. And I just thought it was so sweet. And then like months into these discussions, he asked me what a vaccine was. And I said that it was a shot and he was not impressed anymore. (laughs) He was like, I'm, Oh, okay. Well, like I am not interested in that. I didn't know a vaccine was a shot. And he like totally changed his uh, mind about that. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Of course he's not eligible yet, but I mean, my kids, like many kids always ask if we're going to the doctor, like, are we going to have to get a shot? So how common is a fear of vaccines or needles in kids? 
Yeah, needle fears and needle anxiety are super common. I mean, in kids and adults, let's face it, none of us like getting a needle at the doctor's. And uh, you're right. The first thing kids ask, the first thing even my kids ask when I tell them we have a doctor's appointment is, you know, are we going to get a needle? Uh, the research shows that, you know, two out of every three children um, has a, a fear of needles. Uh, one out of every four adults um, has a fear of needles. And roughly one out of 10 adults has a fear of needles that's so significant that it impacts their willingness to, you know, engage with medical care. So, you know, it, it, people often say it's just a needle, you know, it, it'll be over soon. But the reality is, you know, the, the pain and fear associated with needles is, is really a significant pu public health issue. And, you know, we're, we're seeing it play out, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Yeah, I, I had no idea, actually. I didn't know those stats you just said, but even finding out now throughout the pandemic that I have adult friends of mine who are really afraid of needles and that it has affected their willingness or, you know, just kind of how long they delayed maybe getting the vaccine. So that definitely surprised me. So how do we prepare our kids um, in advance for getting a vaccine? Is this something that we should you know, whether it's the COVID-19 vaccine or, you know, any shot that they might have to get at the doctor, is it better to just kind of like surprise them with it, spring it on them? Or, you know, should we be talking to them in advance about it? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, generally speaking, it's best to just be honest and upfront with kids. Just providing a bit of backstory for why they need the shot and, um, you know, why vaccines are so important. I think that really helps kids to understand, you know, that there's a greater good and, a, you know, and, and the greater purpose here, depending on the age of the child, you, you know, you may not want to tell them really far in advance. Now, some kids telling them a month in advance, they're just going to spend a month worrying. Right. Um, but, you know, for older children, giving them a heads up anywhere from, you know, five to seven days before, uh, for young kids, even just the day before is, you know, is a good strategy. Some parents have, you know, get into the habit of just not telling their children. They think it'll be harder to get them to the doctor's office if they tell them. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, that tends to backfire, at least in the long run, because what that does is, you know, eventually when the child realizes what's happening, um, it really erodes trust, uh, both in you know, the health professional and, you know, on the part of the parent, they, they won't trust you the next time if they say, am I going to get a needle and you evade it or you say mm -hmm. no, um, when in fact they need one. So generally speaking, giving kids um, advance notice um, at least a couple of days for older kids uh, is best. Okay. No, that helps a lot. I actually have a question here that I recorded from my six-year-old. And if you can't understand it, I will, I will, tr I will translate it. <laughs> what can parents do to make shots easier for kids? What can parents do to make shots easier for kids? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we talked a little bit about in advance, but what about, um, I suppose in the moment when you're at, when you're at the doctor's office? Yeah, so fortunately, you know, research has shown that there's lots of things that parents can do in advance and, you know, during the procedure to make things easier for kids. Uh, so one of the major reasons why kids are afraid of needles and even adults is that they hurt. Um, and so, you know, that that pain associated with the needle um, is often a, a source of distress. And in fact, you know, when you talk to adults about uh, why they're afraid of needles. I mean, most of the adult patients that I've worked with can trace their needle back to like one poorly managed painful experience as a child. So uh, thankfully, there's been tons of research on what to do to reduce pain from vaccination. Uh, and so there's, there's a bunch of things that parents can do, and they're generally in three different categories. So one of those categories is the, a, a P for pharmacological, um, another P for psychological, and then a P for physical strategies. So we think about those three buckets. In the pharmacological kind of category, uh, there is a numbing cream that you can purchase at your local pharmacy, and it's not very expensive, um, although the cost you know, can be a barrier for some people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this cream, if you apply it to the skin and depending on the type of cream that you get, could be, you know, 30 to, to 60 to 90 minutes before the needle uh, actually significantly reduces the pain associated with the needle. Uh, so there's tons of research showing that, that this cream really is effective. Um, so I've used it on my 
own children. Mm -hmm. And there's also a psychological benefit too. I mean, you apply it before you go, you talk about numbing cream, some people call it, you know, a magical cream um, that will help the hurt. Then when you actually get to the procedure, um, some of the physical uh, strategies, and again, the vaccinator will usually be well informed, you know, in terms of the physical positioning, but having children sit up um, or older children at least sit up rather than laying down to get their vaccination. People have studied these different variables of just your positioning and how that can impact um, your pain experience. Uh, so usually the vaccinator is pretty well informed um, on those strategies. And then the psychological is really important. And this is where, you know, parents can play a big role, which is making sure that your child is distracted and relaxed. Um, so for distraction, I just bring my phone with me and make sure I have something novel on my phone that my kids will like to play or watch while they're getting their needle. In terms of relaxation, it could just be taking some deep breaths, um, encouraging children to kind of tense their muscles uh, so that they're tense like a robot and then relaxing them like a spaghetti noodle. And that kind of promotes uh, relaxation. So those strategies, you know, really, really do make a difference. And I, you know, can't overstate the importance of distraction for, for young kids. Yeah, we, um, I watched some of your videos before they had, I think their flu shots last year. And so we got pain patches. I think they were at the local pharmacy. And so we talked about how they were magic patches that were going to help them, um, you know, feel less pain during their shots. And that definitely helped them. So it's interesting about the positions though, too. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So it's better to be sitting up than laying down. Yeah. And, you know, when you have a baby too, there's other strategies. Uh, so for moms who are still breastfeeding, mm -hmm. what's fascinating is breastfeeding has been found to be analgesic. It significantly reduces pain from needles. So, um, you know, for those early vaccinations, and if we get to a point where, you know, infants are being vaccinated for, yeah. uh, for, co for COVID-19, um, then, you know, the simple breastfeeding, uh, you know, can make a huge difference and reduce pain. And, and then again, that's easy for parents to do. Uh, uh, there's lots of, of, you know, stigma sometimes or misconceptions, yeah. is a better word. Uh, people think that, you know, it's not good to associate needles with breastfeeding or that babies mm -hmm. might choke if they're breastfed, but research has shown that that isn't the case and that it's really a useful way to reduce pain during needles. Yeah. I had to push back a little bit about that. I remember when my kids were breastfeeding and, um, and I wanted to, when, when they were getting their vaccine. So, and, and <sighs> It's funny you brought up having like one bad experience. I just remember this awful time of my my toddler having to get his blood drawn, which you know all toddlers just love to do and are so good at it. And I was like seven months pregnant and I was trying to hold him and the nurse was getting really frustrated. And I think my son was picking up on that, right? And so I was just thinking as you were talking about how, you know, you said one in 10 adults have a significant, right, fear of needles. I think I got that correct. Yeah. So, and just thinking psychologically about how our own anxieties and our own fear about the needles. I mean, we know that even infants and toddlers can pick up on our emotions, um, the emotions of their parents. And so what do you recommend for parents in terms of how they are behaving or acting with regard to their own anxieties and fears maybe while their kid is having this done? Yeah, it's such a great point. And, um, you know, I, I think adults and parents really underestimate the impact that their own emotions and anxiety can have on their children. So it's really important to keep that in check. And one of my former PhD students, Megan McMurtry, who's now um, a professor at Guelph, uh, she had a fascinating dissertation study where uh, she looked at exactly this. So there's been a lot of, of research that's looked at the relationship between different types of parental behaviors and child pain and distress during needles. So one of the sort of best known findings is that when parents reassure their children um, during a medical procedure, so it'll be over soon, you're doing great, mm -hmm. that that has actually been related to increases in child pain and distress during the procedure, which is a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, and so Megan did a series of studies to try to figure out why, like why would reassuring a child 
um, make them feel worse. Uh, that's not the parent's intent. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, Megan found that when parents reassure, like it'll be okay, it'll, they're doing it because they themselves are feeling anxious or worried. Uh, and she did a series of experimental studies to try to get at this, but uh, was able to show that when parents reassure, children perceive their parents as anxious. And that is sort of what drives the increase in their anxiety and pain during needles. So for parents, some of the best things that parents can do when their children are having procedures are using distraction techniques. So, okay, let's focus on something else. Let's count the tiles on the wall. Um, you know, there's lots of, of different things you can do to distract, give um, specific suggestions on coping strategies. Uh, so, you know, let's take a deep breath together. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, just using humor when appropriate to try to just make the situation feel a little lighter. And so, you know, sometimes we do get into situations where, um, you know, after a series of attempts, the medical professionals can be getting stressed, the parents mm -hmm. can be getting stressed. It's, it's okay to call a timeout um, and to just kind of regroup and, and come back with a slightly different plan. And so just making sure that everybody is kept calm. And I think for parents, often when procedures are happening, it's at a time of uncertainty. You might be in an emergency department and you're yeah. not sure you know, your child needs blood work because they're concerned. And so for parents, you know, it's more than just the procedure at times. It's worry about their child's health. And so really using the strategies yourself uh, to stay calm and to stay focused on your child and offering really practical kind of distraction coping type statements um, really is best. Oh, good. Okay. I like that. That's a good transition to, to thinking about doctors and nurses too. So I have another question here from my six-year-old. What can doctors and nurses do to, to make shots easier for kids? <laughs> What, what can, can doctors yeah. do to make shots easier for kids? Again, another great question. And, you know, uh, many of the strategies that we talked about for parents work work with adults too and, and you know, the vaccinators. So just, just being honest, being very calm, uh, providing distraction, providing a lot of praise. Um, and, you know, we often talk about what you do before the procedure, what you do, um, you know, during the procedure, but what happens after the procedure is almost just as important. Another former student of mine, uh, Melanie Knoll, who's now a professor in Calgary, her work is focused on children's memories for pain. And she's actually found that it's not actually how much pain a child has during a needle, but how much pain they remember having after the needle's over. Um, and that's influenced by anxiety and it's influenced yeah. by, you know, what adults, including the health professionals, say to the child. Uh, and so following best practices for vaccination, and there actually is a national clinical practice guideline uh, for physicians, nurses, and other vaccinators that was led by my colleague, Anna Taddeo, uh, and myself and others have been a part of this. And so there are, you know, best practices around vaccine administration uh, and, you know, things like positioning to make sure that you're offering the most uh, pain relieving experience as possible for kids. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of like go-to phrase or thing you wish uh, every nurse would say, or I guess not say um, <laughs> before, just before giving a vaccine? You know, what I find is that many of them have their own sort of strategy that they've evolved over time. Most of it involves distraction, yeah. um, you know, so kind of orienting the child's attention away. Uh, and I think for the most part, I mean, no, doctors and nurses who administer vaccinations get really good at it because, yeah. you know, they don't have a lot of return customers. If <laughs> so, right. um, you know, they do really, they do really um, develop quite a, quite a skill set at being able to do this in an effective way, which is, is fantastic. That's true. I remember at our old pediatrician office, like they can be so fast and efficient and good with it that the kid is like, wait, what just happened by the time, you know, and they're done. So, yeah, so that's true. There could be definitely their own individual, uh, take on it, um, on what to say. So I was doing some background research to have this conversation. And I was actually really surprised to hear one doctor say that it's usually older children and teens who have the hardest time with vaccines. Um, I don't know if that's 
if that's consistent with what the research actually shows. I mean, maybe I'm biased because I have, you know, toddlers and young kids, but I had assumed it was those younger kids that would really be the problem that, well, problem might be a, the wrong word to use there, but like more difficult with, with uh, getting them. So is it, is that the case? And then why, why is it? Yeah, I mean, I think needle fears and hesitancies are are present, you know, in kids of all ages, but I think it does become a little harder to manage when kids get older, they have minds of their own, they're bigger than you. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, when you have younger children, I mean, you are much more in control as a parent, right? Like you you can control the, the medical decision making and the setting and the, and you know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, I'm the parent of four, two teenagers now. Um, you know, unless they're on board, it's really hard to get them to do what you want them to do. And so I think yeah. maybe that's where some of that's coming from, which is you know, my 15 year old is six foot one right now, there would be (laughs) no me taking him to the doctor if he didn't want to go. And so part of what parents need to do over time is, and that's why that that explanation, that age appropriate explanation from an early stage really is so important. So it's not just something that's being done to them that their parent is, you know, insisting on that it's really um, part of an understanding of the the benefits of vaccination and to to yourself and to others. And there's so many opportunities to have these conversations now um, so that when they are older, they can appreciate and internalize that themselves. And it was funny, one of my kids, my 13 year old recently, we were talking about vaccine hesitancy and, um, you know, some of the the challenges of what's happening with the pandemic, because everybody's vaccinated. And my son was like, I'm so glad I have parents who understand science and can help me make the right choices. Right. And so that that rationale and that developing a sense of why it's important, I think is, is really critical. I also think, you know, making sure we offer children the best possible, you know, vaccination experience or whatever experience. I mean, Mm -hmm. children who have a negative experience with a needle in the emergency department, you know, may then um, not just become fearful of that experience, but fearful of any needle experience. And so, you know, this is why we advocate for effective pain management management as soon as possible um, Mm -hmm. so that children develop positive ways of coping so that when they're older, um, that they know that there are things that can be done to make it more pleasant. Yeah. I I was blown away. Like I watched your TED talk and I was completely blown away about some of the relatively recent history of, you know, babies and pain management. And um, I definitely was not aware of, uh, of that history and it was just mind blowing. So Thank you for sharing that. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes so people can watch that as well. At Pandemic Parenting, we're committed to sharing our expertise and research in ways that are immediately accessible and useful to families. As part of our efforts to sustain and expand this work, Amanda and I are also available for virtual speaking engagements at your business, organization, PTO, and more. We want to help you and those you work with, grow with, and raise your children with have the chance to do so in an environment that fosters and supports your mental health. Some of the topics we speak on include parenting during the pandemic, the impact of trauma on children and families, children's development, the mental health impact of COVID-19 on employees, and more. If you or your organization are interested in potentially collaborating with us, please reach out for availability and pricing through the request a speaker form on our website at www.pandemic-parent.org slash contact. So I read it and it might have been something that you wrote actually, but that there's this 17 year gap between, you know, when research is done on a topic and when it's actually taken up as practice in everyday life or in, you know, maybe the medical system. How do you think we can shorten that time period when it comes to things like vaccines and children's pain management? Yeah, that's a statistic that I and others cite all the time. It's just fascinating to think about how long the, it takes for science to mm-hmm. evolve. And, and, you know, this past year has been a real eye opener in terms of we can't wait 17 years for the results mm-hmm. of science to get to the <laughs> front lines. And so in terms of, you know, understanding you know, the importance of making sure science moves quickly into practice and policy. We've just had an incredible firsthand example of why that's important. But yes, it's true across many areas. And certainly in the past, progress has been really slow. And and part of that is the way that research works, right? I mean, we researchers, we get funding to study a problem. We do the study, we publish 
the results in a journal we present at a conference and then the cycle repeats itself. We use that track record to get another grant and answer another question. And the way that the research system works, if we're not incentivized or really you know, motivated or encouraged or rewarded uh, or expected to actually make sure that the results of that research translates into improvements in practice and policy. And so that's the, the process of knowledge translation or increasingly um, we hearing knowledge mobilization of, mm-hmm. of moving research into practice. And it's a completely different skill set than, you know, uh, some, some scientists have complementary skill sets. They are really good at asking and answering questions. And they also have an interest and, in, in, you know, talent for developing the relationships that are needed to help move research into practice. But not all scientists do. And so uh, this is one of the areas that I'm really interested in is how do we support capacity to improve the way that we move science into action for vaccinations and for, you know, a wide variety of child health issues and uh, shrink that 17 year gap. And I often remind people, you know, 17 years is an entire childhood. It's a whole generation of kids who miss out on the benefits of knowledge that we already have. And again, this year, I mean, we've seen that it's more than just communicating science. It's about developing trust and building relationships engaging those who need the research in the research process from the very beginning. So it's a very complicated process. And I think one that we'll be reflecting a lot more about. Yeah. And it's not even just, I mean, because I'm sort of at the intersection of psychology and law, we see the same thing with the science and procedures that have been developed in, you know, in the research, just taking decades or more to actually become implemented in our legal practice and in our legal systems. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. We definitely need a lot of work on that. Well, which is one of the reasons you started the, it doesn't have to hurt campaign, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and and tell maybe parents where they can find resources related to it? Yeah. So, you know, my interest in knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization really surfaced after I had my own children became a parent myself. And all of a sudden I realized that all this science that I had been publishing, contributing to presenting at conferences wasn't actually getting used to the benefit of my own children. So when I was taking my children in for procedures or doctor's visits, all this research evidence um, just wasn't being used. And, And I knew that the evidence you know, showed that if we did these certain things, then, you know, they would have less pain. And I was really interested in like, why, why aren't people, you know, using this? Uh, And so I did a fellowship in media and advocacy and policy. And as part of my fellowship, I created a YouTube video for parents. Uh, So it was just a a very brief two minute video in which we shared evidence based information with parents from the perspective of a young girl. Uh, After that video went live, um, we scaled up to more of a social media initiative called It Doesn't Have to Hurt, where we partnered with a major online parenting blog um, and sort of digital media platform called Yummy Mummy Club. And we provided the science uh, on various topics in children's pain, so vaccinations, as well as a variety of other topics. Then they basically knowledge translated it into social media images for Instagram, YouTube videos, blogs, Uh, So we had a a one-year campaign, um, and it was very effective. We had a huge reach um, and engagement, and Canadian parents really kind of became the primary disseminators of information about children's pain. And then from that, we we scaled up to uh, what is now known as SKIP, Solutions for Kids in Pain, which is a federally funded national knowledge mobilization network. Uh, So we've really come a long way. We've gone from, you know, a small video for parents, a short Mm -hmm. video for parents to a larger social media initiative, and then a much broader uh, national network that focuses on connecting evidence with those who need it in the area of children's pain management. Yeah, that video is great. That's the one that I watched uh, before my kids had their flu shots last year. So we'll definitely make sure we link to it in the in the show notes. And that's one of the things Amanda and I have been trying to do with pandemic parenting. And it's you realize very quickly how how many different skill sets are involved in doing this kind of work. And so we have people who help us create infographics and other, you know, social media type things. And so there's a lot of things we don't know and understand about marketing and about distilling that information in a way that's actually going to be helpful and practically useful for parents. And so 
yeah, we definitely need more of that training in, I don't know where in grad school in lots of different uh, situations, I think. So, so I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but I've heard rumors that it could be very soon that we could have a vaccine fingers crossed for kids 11 and under, which both of mine fall into that category. So I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Um, do you think that better management of children's pain and, and adherence to this kind of best practice of vaccine administration will affect vaccine uptake moving forward and, and will actually help us get out of this pandemic at some point? <laughs> yeah, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, but certainly, I mean, we know that pain and fear of needles is a, a contributor to vaccine hesitancy. And so, you know, it may not be the number one reason why people don't get vaccinated, but it certainly is a reason. And it is, a, sometimes I joke, it's a little, it's a, a dirty little secret. People are embarrassed uh, to admit that they're afraid of needles. I often am engaging with adults. They hear what I do and they will kind of confess to me that, you know, they, they have a fear of needles. And, and so I think we really need to create more of a conversation around this and acknowledge that it is an issue for a lot of people. There are things that you can do both to prevent and minimize pain associated with needles and also letting people know that, you know, if your fear is so significant, that is essentially a full bone phobia, um, you know, psychologists are really, if like there's effective treatments for uh, phobias, um, mm -hmm. behavioral treatments and, and working, you know, even just a, a couple of brief sessions with a psychologist. I mean, there's a lot of complex reasons why people don't get vaccinated and they're not always easily addressed. But in my view, um, you know, treating and addressing the pain and fear associated with needles is one where we have tons of research. We know what works to minimize pain, to treat fear. And I'm seeing as we move along into different stages of the, the pandemic, and certainly now we're more interested in targeting particular groups of people who are, um, you know, not getting vaccinated for whatever reasons. I'm mm -hmm. um, seeing vaccine clinics, you know, openly advertising that, you know, if you're afraid of needles, we are offering a, an experience I saw in Toronto. I think Cam H was offering a vaccine clinic for people who are afraid of needles with you know, individuals hmm. working there who are very sensitive to it, who can understand it. Um, just that opportunity and that kind of flexibility can be huge for someone with a fear of needles. So I think normalizing this, acknowledging um, that this is a problem for a lot of kids, a lot of parents, and a lot of adults, and then, you know, making sure that solutions are, are made available, um, both solutions that are immediate in terms of your immediate vaccination experience, but also in terms of helping people prepare in advance. Absolutely. Yeah. I imagine there's a lot of adults right now who are having to confront this fear and they haven't had to for a very long time, or, you know, maybe even since childhood, if they, you know, if they haven't traveled or, you know, that much, or maybe, you know, don't get the flu shot for whatever reason. And now they're having to really confront this fear head on with, you know, COVID vaccination maybe being required for their work or school or all sorts of things. So it's good to know that a lot of these same strategies that you talked about for kids will also hopefully work for adults. Um, so I guess as a final note, what is one thing you would want to say to parents who might be slightly traumatized from past experiences <laughs> involving, you know, their kids getting very upset during vaccines. And so they're nervous about doing the, you know, the COVID vaccine with their kids. Yeah, I mean, I would say we have all had bad experiences and, and parenting is full of, you know, uh, good experiences and bad experiences, and you just never know what you're going to get. But I think that, you know, working together, having a plan, um, you know, pulling up some of the information we have on, you know, our it doesn't have to hurt.ca website or kidsinpain.ca. Uh, there's lots of great tips and, and tools there for parents, videos, handouts. Um, that if you have a plan, you can, you know, really have a much more positive experience. There are fairly easy strategies that you can um, apply to, to make a difference. So don't be discouraged, have a positive attitude and, um, you know, realize that there are things that you can do to help. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. Make sure to hit follow or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whichever platform you're listening on to be notified of future episodes. We'd also love to connect with you on social media. Look for our blue and yellow logo when you search Pandemic Parenting on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or YouTube, and you'll find us. Or follow the links in the show notes. Let us know what you think of this episode by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Your five-star review helps us move up the charts to reach even more parents and caregivers. If you have a specific question or topic you'd like us to address in a future episode, let us know. You can email info at pandemic-parent.org and mention podcast in the subject line. And this podcast isn't all we do, by the way. Pandemic Parenting is a 501c3 nonprofit providing free science-based resources for parents and all who care for children while navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. To learn more about our organization and access our extensive library of webinars, videos, blogs, and more, visit www.pandemic-parent.org. Lastly, this show wouldn't be possible without supporters like you. Lindsay and I donate our time to this podcast, but we do have an incredible team working behind the scenes to make this all happen. If you'd like to support the show beyond leaving your five-star review, visit www.pandemic-parent.org support and donate today. Thanks for listening. Hope you can join us next time.